Welcome to Graphic Policy Radio. This is a comics podcast. This is your host, Ilana Levin, a.k.a. Ilana Brooklyn. And this is a comics podcast for people who love cats and comics, <laughs> hate colonialism, and have better taste in music than you. That's right. I've got a great comics writer guest today joining me with a really interesting background in music and more. Um, I'm joined by Carlos Gifoni. Uh, Carlos was a singer in a punk band in Venezuela when he was 14. Since then, he has been involved in experimental music as a musician with over a dozen releases, a curator of the No Fun Fest and label owner of No Fun Productions, a fellow Iggy Pop fan, clearly. Uh, He collaborated on records with Thurston Moore, Lee Ronaldo, oh my God, Sonic Youth, (laughs) Nels Klein, and Jim O'Rourke when he lived in New York, among others. While touring the world, he worked with Japanese noise artists such as Merzabau and Astro, complete legends. Uh, Besides his sound work, he also has over a decade of production and creative direction experience in video games, where he's worked on comics projects for The League of Legends, South Park, Ugly Americans, I remember that show very fondly. That's fun. The Daily Show and other established properties. He currently lives in LA with his two cats, Victor and Lou Reed, where he started writing comic books a few years ago with two creator-owned series announced and more on the way. So those two series that we're going to be focusing on today are Strayed, which has just come out from Dark Horse. Uh, The description is, In the far future, a military-industrial complex reigns over all humanity and actively destroys distant alien worlds. The galaxy's only hope can be found through an unlikely pair, an astral-projecting cat named Lou and his loving owner, Kiara, Trading nine lives for the well-being of billions, their revolt is a battle for love, friendship, compassion, and the soul of humanity. And launching into space right now as well is Space Rider's Vortex of Darkness, which um, is on uh, Black Mask comics. Uh, It has been 20 years since the Riders defeated the Destroyer God of Evil and saved the galaxy. The Space Riders no longer exist, and the galaxy has moved on from them. When the mother of all evil gods appears and threatens to take control of every dimension and every strain of possible reality the cybernetically enhanced x riders will have to come together to travel into her mind to assassinate her soul it's a suicidal mission into an infinite vortex of blood and death (laughs) welcome to the show carlos thank you so much i'm super excited to be here me too um let's uh open up real quick um just so uh, uh space riders um that's re- that, well, that's with art by um, Alexis Serrett. Alexis Serrett, and he's the sort of founder and creator of the series, right? Correct. Yeah. So that's something. One of those comics where when I saw it on the shelf, I was like, "Good God, that looks incredibly psychedelic and amazing! What in God's name is this?" And Same. I, right? Like <laughs> nothing else looks like that on the shelf. It has this completely wild psychedelic, but like seventies psychedelic. Yeah, and but there's also very uh, modern. Yep, and there's yeah. like that dirty texture to it, um, like mm-hmm. it's been around for years, just sitting there, you know. <laughs> That's so, a great description. Yeah. How did what 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 got you involved in working on that title? Yeah, so um, just like you, I I saw Space Riders uh, around, and I I was really impressed by it. I really love the art style. Um, there was uh, an aspect of nostalgia to it and psychedelia that was super resonant for me. Um, and um, I, I loved it. I actually went out of my way to find a copy of Volume 1, which, which, which was out of print at the time. Um, and uh, yeah, when I was uh, going around cons, basically pitching uh, straight and another book and just networking and meeting people, I ran into Alexis. Um, and I started talking to him because uh, I love uh, space writers. And we figured out that uh, we were both uh, Venezuelan. Uh, and we both had a lot of things in common, and we ended up becoming good friends. I ran into him in like multiple conferences uh, last year, and then um, and he had seen Straight, and and he really uh, he was a fan of it. He's actually making a, um, an alt uh, cover for issue three, um, mm. and he called me up uh, in uh, I, I believe it was in November last year, and uh, he said, "Hey." Um, would you like to write the next volume of Space Riders? And I thought he was pranking me initially, mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, he was not. Um, so, yeah, I, I was super excited. I said yes, and, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be out soon. That's so wild. I, it's a sort of comic where I just, it looks like such a creator 
driven like child of the writer it's it, of the initial creator of the series I, I i am really i was really surprised to hear that he was bringing in somebody to uh to write on a new part of the series but i i'm really liking it i'm really liking it I'm glad you are. Yeah, it was. Uh, I was just as surprised when it first happened. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I really wanted to make an effort because I know um, that people that like this book are really into this book. Um, the fans really love it. And um, um, uh, I wanted to make justice to that. So I yeah. really put a lot of effort into uh, putting together something cool. And actually, when I first um, did the treatment for it, um, I, you know, I read volume one and two many times and I created something that was a sort of continuation to that. Um, and I sent it to Alexis and he was like, no, <laughs> he, he was like, no, no, make it your own. So, uh, oh, wow. and then, uh, you know, I, 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 I was thrilled to do that. So I went back and, um, you know, having the, the 20 year gap in their, in the lives of the ra of the writers, uh, really uh, gave me the opportunity to to think about them in a different way, and I added my own twist to it. That I, you know, that when I sent it to him, he he really loved it, and uh, yeah, and that's uh, that's uh, Vortex of Darkness. Well, I want to emphasize to people that when we say space riders, we do in fact mean people on space motorcycles. <laughs> There are people in space motorcycles. There are, uh, you know, space wizards. There are undead uh, zombies in space. Um, there are, um, you know, space demons. There are other dimensions that the writers will travel to. Um, so it's definitely not your typical comic book. There are space baboons who <laughs> meditate and astral project. Correct, yes. And uh, yeah, that's Mono, who is the defender of the sacred fire. So yeah, <laughs> I really love Mono. Like, what a cool character. <laughs> uh, he's amazing. And I, you know, he right from the first issue, he's someone that I that I wanted to, uh, to write and use a lot into it. So um, he, him and Peligro are, are, you know, the first two characters that you see on the book. Uh, and like with Peligro, like I, I love you know, like the sort of casual Spanish that's throughout yeah. some of the writing in it. Yeah. And like, so, I mean, I, wh 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 why, why has including that been important to you in the series? <laughs> oh, uh, that, that made the book so special to me because beyond the art, right, the fact that they're, they're Spanish in it, and I'm, you know, originally a Spanish speaker being Venezuelan, just like Alexis, um, it, it just spoke to me in a different way, you know, and it comes out as really you know, uh, legit, you know, it's genuine because it, yeah. it, it comes from people that speak Spanish. Um, and um, the fact that um, for this time around, we're both Venezuelan with a similar similar background and we're similar age, um, we actually go even deeper on some of the terms and some of the Easter eggs that we put in there um, mm -hmm. uh, for both people that, you know, are fans of the series, but also for um, people that might be not American, right? And might see something in there that other people might miss. That's great. I really love it. I like, I mean, I understand some Spanish, <laughs> so I'm not coming at it like completely, completely without uh, any understanding. But um, yeah, but, and a yeah, lot of it, really, it is just like, you know, the it's, cursing it's is in Spanish. Stuff. Yeah, 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 it's a cursing. You know, if you're in America, you, you have some Spanish yeah. comprehension. And, you know, I mean, I lived in Miami, New York, and L.A., so um, yeah. definitely lots of Spanish there. But I could understand how some someone maybe in, like, Utah or, you know, Idaho or something, maybe. I don't know, man. Who knows? You, you, you got Sesame Street on TV for that's little kids. True. Sesame that's Street. True. That's where I first learned Spanish, so. That's true. That's true. So, I don't know. It's it's, it's really, like, it's like the, it's the other American language. So, I, I love having... I, I, I love I loved having it there because yeah it just felt like very natural but yeah. like definitely was an artistic choice. Yeah no absolutely and and you know it's really fun trying to figure out okay what other uh, you know curses in Spanish can we do that have not been <laughs> used yet. <laughs> um, so yeah that was really a fun part of it. Um, with the uh, with the with the world that you're working that you're writing in, like you know, I think if people had to pick one word to describe, it would definitely be psychedelic. Mm -hmm. uh, what what does that mean to you as an aesthetic that you're writing in, like as a writer rather than as an illustrator? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you know, uh, for for my other book, for straight, 
um, we had an editor on, and uh, uh, I crafted it in a different way um, than I did for Space Rider. And what I mean by that is that the state of mind of writing Space Riders is very much um, trying to get in a zone <laughs> where the stuff is just kind of coming out, right? Um, mm -hmm. So um, it, it's kind of trying to find uh, a different state of mind and just letting it go, basically. Um, and I think that's something that is it's apparent on the other um, two volumes uh, where you feel like it's really easy to read, uh, it's really easy to, to follow, and it feels very, very natural. Um, so there was no editor on this book, um, and uh, I just kind of went with whatever, you know, with, with some ideas that I discussed with Alexis, uh, but that f just felt right, you know, and, and we just, we had no one telling us what we could or we couldn't do. I mean, that's usually the case with uh, creator-owned books, but uh, mm -hmm. more so in this one where it was just me and him, you know, going back and forth. Um, so, uh, and, and I'm obviously writing for him, right? Um, so a every time I'm writing um, any of the panel descriptions, um, the dialogue as well, I am thinking uh, about what it's going to look like in the page, right? Um, obviously, he's surprising me because his artwork is insane. Um, so mm -hmm. he's doing very unexpected things. But I'm, I'm going in with that idea of like, okay, what would be cool for Alexis uh, to draw um, that would have that psychedelic um, effect to, to people? What are your inspirations in terms of psych making psychedelic art, uh, both, you know, whether it's writing <laughs> or music or film? Yeah, so um, definitely, um, I mean, other music. So, uh, you know, I was listening to, to a lot of, uh, for this book, a lot of metal, um, a lot yeah. of like abstract, noisy stuff, um, you know, some... Uh, yeah, some stuff from the 70s too, some doom metal, okay, some Melvins. Okay, which 70s bands? Uh, which 70s bands? I need to know. Because uh, that I, I'll know. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, King Crimson, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, uh, that's a jam. Uh, so yeah, that, that primarily. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I also like, I like like Cluster, you know, like more abstract, mm -hmm. like electronic stuff as well. Um, mm. And um, yeah. Um, all the good stuff. I definitely, for me, like I associated the earlier volume definitely was like I am listening to Hawkwind, but I oh, to Hawkwind, Hawkwind is amazing. So uh, Hawkwind, I, I I love as well. <laughs> and actually, you know, one of the things that that I love about that band is that they have this synthesizer that's called a Synthi mm -hmm. AKS, which makes everything um, kind of you know it adds all the like background more psychedelic electronic sound that some of those songs uh, they have and yeah. actually I own one of those synthesizers <gasps> and I use you it a do? lot for my music so oh um, my God. I feel I, I feel a, 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 you know a, a connection to that band for sure <laughs> I just love that there's a guy in the band whose name is Dick Mick and his job is making <laughs> space sounds perfect and I, I remember. I don't remember how old it is when somebody pointed out, like, you know, there is no sound in space, so there's like no such thing as space sounds. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> Whatever those noises that they're making are are space sounds. Um, so yeah. Anyway. Yeah. No, I adore I adore Hawkwind. I definitely sort of I associated the the volume with, you know, like the the world building with Hawkwind as well. Um, I think that you know those guys are a lot more. Um, Hawkwind is a lot less down and dirty, though, right? Yeah. But there's definitely feels like it feels like this could be in the same world, but this is in a very different corner of the world. Right. The 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 back alley bar part <laughs> of that world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, are there any sort of like science fiction writers that were oh, an influence for you? Um, I mean, I definitely, uh, you know, I I read a lot of Asimov. I've read every Asimov book. Oh man, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, uh, Philip K. Dig, uh, um, all the Dune books, I read the whole series, so like any, you know, the, the full, all the Herbert ones, the original ones, not mm -hmm. the ones from his son. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> I see Dune, I see definitely see Dune in, in Strayed, when I'm looking at Strayed. Yeah. I mean, I love Dune, it's probably my, my favorite uh, book series, um, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, my favorite film to watch is probably, you know, Jodorowsky's Dune, which is a documentary yes. about the movie that didn't get made, but it is so inspiring and, and so sad at the same time, uh, but it's yeah. so inspiring to see, like, the group of people that Jodorowsky got for, uh, for that film, um, uh, and it was going to be amazing, you know, and of course, like, beginning with Mobius uh, drawing all the, the, 
um, the scenes. Um, and I, I really wish for the day that that book becomes available, the one that they le left at Studios, which is basically Mobius drawing um, the entire movie, you know, it's super thick. And um, um, yeah, I never seen it. It exists somewhere. <laughs> mm. Yeah, we would love to get our hands on that to be able to see the original art um in like one place and yeah but i definitely feel like you know a lot of the material that you're writing in spa in um, not in space writers but in strayed yeah is covering similar sort of political and environmental concerns as as the dune series is um so let me hop over to so let me hop over to strayed for just a bit uh when, when i when you sent me the comic i i had a moment where i messaged you and i was like mm -hmm. Is there a cat in peril in this? Because if there's a cat in peril in this, then I can't read it. This is not a critique of your art. This is just the reality of my own emotional needs. And you sort of talked with me about, you know, like, you know, there's no animals like getting hurt, but there is emotional, you know, there's emotional concern. There's, yeah. um, you know, this is not like a, it's, person it's, petting a cat in their lap no. at a coffee shop, you know. But no, it, it's not a fairy tale by any means. Uh, it, it's a really serious story, which you know sounds ridiculous when we're talking about an astral traveling cat. Um, but that's just part of, uh, I think, what makes it fun. Um, and, and absolutely, you know, I, I wanted to, when you said that, I wanted to make sure you, you understood that I, I personally love uh, um, animals uh, very yes. much. I have two cats that I love, and it does. I, I do have the same kind of reaction to when I see an animal hurt, whether it's on film or on a on a comic book, which has happened before, um, yeah. physically, right? It's really hard. And yeah. I think I was thinking all that, this today, and I think the reason is because um, um, I think we are so used to differentiating uh, humans and different people that when someone gets uh, a, a fictitious person gets hurt in a, in a movie or in a book, unless we have something that we can relate to with them, we don't feel that bad. But when an animal, you know, uh, feels, uh, gets hurt, we immediately think about an animal that we love, right? Or, or mm -hmm. an animal that we know that got hurt. At least that's the way I experience it, you know? Um, so um, I can totally relate to that feeling. So um, no physical like direct harm but he's definitely going to be under a lot of stress um, because yeah. Lou the cat is um, it's traveling trying to find new planets um, he's trying to make his uh, his owner um, Kiara happy and they're being used by this uh, military uh, you know um, compound that is trying to to find those new planets to colonize them and they initially don't know, but they're going to find out. And then they're going to have to make some difficult choices. Yeah. And I, I think you did a great job of helping me understand, like, whether this was something I could read or not. And I could. I could. Um, so if you, like me, sure. are someone who cannot deal with pain for animals. Like, I haven't read We Three because I'm convinced that something bad must be happening to the animals <laughs> in We Three. Like, there's I just a lot of... To, well, I don't want to get you sidetracked, but like, I just assume I was gonna be like, can I read We Three? I don't know. Yeah. But like, I've always been like, just hyper. I, you know, I didn't see that Coen Brothers movie where the folk singer played by Oscar Isaac has a cat because I kept really being concerned that the cat could get injured, especially since he was just being carried around in the guy's arms around the city. How would this cat not get lost? Like, right. that's my level of cat concern derangedness. Of but course, your comic has totally been fine for me. And I think like you, you, yeah, you, you understand what we mean and i think it's really great like the point you raised about why we've treated that way i like your explanation a lot more than the other ones that have been given for why people are so upset by pets mm -hmm. being hurt and can be so callous to people's heads getting cut off in media etc yeah yeah um I, li I like your theory on that that it makes me feel like a better person so <laughs> than it just being that people aren't as cute as cats um, yeah, most people are not, you know. <laughs> There's not. That's I true. Mean, but, but you're, yeah. Go ahead. But you're. But I like your. I like your reasoning more. I like your reasoning more. I, I think that. Thank I think you. there's something to it. So. Yeah. So. Um, this comic is definitely bringing bringing like a really political question, mm -hmm. and I I think one of the tensions I love is like, you know what, like how are people complicit in projects that are evil and yeah. like what is our responsibility to each other yeah um and i mean and, and i think that there's a parallel there with like colonial times right um mm. where 
um, Europeans were trying to find a new world, right? Because they were looking for resources, right? And I kept thinking, okay, um, as a South American person, um, you know, eventually you think, oh, uh, you know, the colonizers were really evil, right? But, um, you know, there were probably people there that were there to help their families, were there because they needed a job, were there because they had reasons that were not necessarily evil, right? Um, and I've always been um, interested in that kind of, um, you know, um, idea of someone that uh, is, is doing something bad, but uh, for good reasons, right? And in straight, whether what this military unit is trying to do is they're trying to save humanity. They're trying to find more resources to people, but they're, you know, they're probably going um, the wrong way about it, you know? I mean, and there's always this distinction between like, are you, you know, like an oarsman and your family back right. in England is like starving, yep. of, like malnutrition, or are you the person who's, are you are you the captain you know right. where do you find why are you where do you where are you falling in that structure yeah and, and, and yeah and i think it's the same uh you know nowadays too like you might be uh working for a pharmaceutical corporation or for some other uh, for even a mining corporation that's uh, destroying the environment right but that's not that's not the way your world seems to you when you're there and and even at the at the at the level of like who's in charge, um, you know, there's a premier um, Oscar Pili in the book who's kind of like this, this military leader, and um, he doesn't see what he's doing as bad and what he's ordering as bad. He's trying to save humanity in his head, right? Um, you know, so yeah, I think that's that's something that I really like uh, exploring, and and it's interesting to me rather than having. Um, you know, like a mustache twirling uh, back Sure. There, you know? I mean, nobody's evil in their own head, but you also yeah. are making it really clear that what he's doing is immoral. Like, you can see the response from the the creatures that, the, 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 the entities that he's torturing. And I, I think, like, one of the, the interesting tensions is you have this protagonist who's torn between their concern for their cat and their concern for what's possibly an, a more sentient but not known to them. Yeah. Uh, species of on on that planet as well yeah and and i think that again uh, thinking about other times where uh, certain human beings have been um you know not, not necessarily demonized but um dehumanized right where they're mm-hmm. like oh you know they're not really they're, they're savages or they're less than us um and um i i can't imagine for um you know so, some of those people back home that didn't see you know necessarily what was going on with their own eyes they would believe it, right? Um, and same in this case. So you're like, well, you know, we're uh, in the case of straight, um, uh, this imaginary situation where they're invading this planet and, you know, conquering these savages to take the resources. I could see how um, humanity would be able to do that because we have done it before, you know, it's yeah. uh, and history repeats itself. Um, so um, I, I think it, uh, you know, it, it's not far-fetched that, that that's something that could happen. No, I mean, it happens, like, now, like, literally, so, everywhere, Um, yeah, so I I think it's it's really timely uh, to see it expressed that way, thanks, with a series, so is it, is it a, how long, is it like a 12 issue series, or? So, um, uh, the first arc is five issues, Uh, Mm -hmm. it, it comes out, the first issue comes out August 14th. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I wanted to tell a full story, so it is a full contained story, uh, but mm-hmm. we do have ideas for, um, for other arcs. Uh, Where to and, go if it, keep, if it sells. Enough, right, so if it sells well, yeah. we'll definitely do more. Uh, Juan uh, Do, the artist who, who I adore, and it, it's a, an amazing artist, but also an amazing person, uh, really loves what we're doing, uh, and he wants to do more as well. So. We'll see what happens. But for me, it was really important to give a full story in those five issues because I really, um, there, there are books that I, that I like, but when I get to the end, I'm like, oh, they didn't resolve, uh, uh, you know, some of these things uh, or some of the really important things, and they're just trying to hook for um, another, you know, another arc. And then it doesn't happen. I, I, that really, I don't like that feeling of, you know, hanging and not knowing what, what happened in the story. So I, I didn't want to do that. 
Uh, what's the connection for you between like cats and astral projection? Is it like a <laughs> feeling that you get from them or? Um, so, I mean, there's definitely something where I, when I look at my cats, sometimes where I don't know what's going on in their head, right? Um, they could be in another world for all that I know. And sometimes they're looking around and you don't know what they're looking around. So that was like uh, mm -hmm. part of it. Um, and then the other aspect of uh, what made me think of the astral traveling is um, back when I started to work on this book like two years ago, I started reading about uh, this program that the U.S. government was running that was called Remote Viewing. Um, and it was a military program to basically create, uh, try to create uh, spies that would astral travel and spy on, you know, the Russians or spy on other governments. And, and this is clearly, this is documented, like you can go online and you can find documents that are redacted, but that are from government websites that have this information. Um, and that, that program... Um, stopped in, uh, you know, the CIA defunded it in, I believe, in, 90, in, in the early 90s. Uh, because, oh, wow, that's a lot longer than I thought it would yeah, have been. Yeah, <laughs> it, it went on for like, yeah, for like 15 or 20 years. And, and uh, it, it defunded it because it provided no results, right? Um, yeah. So, which makes sense, you know. Um, <laughs> but I, w I was reading about that, that program, and then, you know, I was here at my house, and I was looking at my cat, and then the idea kind of hit me of like, okay, what if it was a cat doing that? And then I started to think about, you know, how a cat will see, uh, you know, the world if he was astral traveling, how he would see, he or she would see space. Um, and um, then I started to think about, like, okay, so how would they communicate uh, with, uh, with someone and, and what, you know, what would happen? And that's kind of like the beginning of uh, how the idea for Straight came about. It's interesting because they, they do so many things that are so hard for us to parse and you sort of try to imagine what their, uh, like what their reasoning is, like what's making them do it. I like the, di my cat dinosaur, you know, <laughs> like one in the morning, she's like, okay, now is the time that I take my toys out of their box, drag them around the apartment while howling and since she's dinosaur, since she's dinosaur, I figure that she's howling because she's trying to summon the other dinosaurs to come through the rift in the time stream to uh, bring makes perfect them from sense. the Jurassic Age. Thank you. It makes perfect, perfect sense. sense. Yeah, I'm so glad you I understand. Can see it. Yeah. So, is, so is that that's what your your cats are up to? They're up to astral projection <laughs> instead of the time rift, I suppose. Absolutely. Or uh, you know, if I leave a, a glass of water outside. Uh, unsupervised, then they're up to knocking it down and breaking it on the floor. But uh, yeah, one of the two things. <laughs> it's because there's ghosts in it. You don't know. Absolutely. There, there's something in there for sure. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, I mean, I, I grew up initially um, with dogs around me and I love dogs mm. as well. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And eventually when I was when I was living in New York, I, I dated someone that had a cat. Um, and at first I didn't understand how a cat worked and I tried to rough it up and play with it and I probably still have scars in my arms <laughs> from that time because they, you know, cats are not like that. Cats have more of a personality where they, they like to be in charge a little bit. They like to be, yeah. they're very curious, but they'll come to you and be amazingly loving, right? Um, so yeah. after a while I figured out and I fell in love with that cat. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, now I, I really love cats and I, I you know, I, I feel definitely uh, more appreciated when, uh, when a cat comes, uh, comes to me and, and gives me a little bit of love versus like a dog's always going to just give you yeah, love every yeah. time, 100%. Cats have judgment, you know, they're deciding if they want to say hi to you or not. It's kind of like people, whenever people are upset, like, well, these cats don't just come when you call. I'm like, well, do people? <laughs> we don't you gotta you, like make it worth it our time it's you, the same you know yes uh, that's true like one of my cats so lou uh, uh lou actually he plays uh fetch sometimes but Aww. it's not on my own terms like um, sometimes yeah. he'll do it he'll <laughs> bring me the ball and then i'll throw it and he bring it back and 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 but if i just you know pull it out and throw it he's just like whatever i'm not interested um and then right, they have to instigate it yeah, yeah totally they will they you know they have their own uh, their own needs and and they they want things when they want things um uh, and then uh victor actually sits in command on command which is is oh, wow. really weird um and uh yeah i don't know many cats that do that but he does and um yeah that's um, wild and he's a They're rescue also special 
he's Aww, he's a rescue so like i don't know like uh victor's a rescue so i don't know if he was trained before but i just you know one day i was giving him a treat and i said sit and he's sad and i and <laughs> since then he just does it so i don't know if he was trained before or he just learned at that moment really fast who knows that's wild yeah i mean are there comics with cats in them that like you think have really successfully <laughs> channeled Katniss successfully before? Uh, so, I mean, the, the one that comes to mind that I, uh, that I really love, it's that, and I don't remember the plot exactly because it's been a while, it's that one issue of Sandman. Um, yeah. That's um, uh, like, yeah, I forget. But with it has, ba- with The one with Bast in it or the one with the kittens? The ones with all the cats. It's all cats, the entire issue. And, uh, yeah. and, and they're talking to each other and they're like... Uh, uh, I believe they're like this this civilization from before humanity or something like that. The I dream can't... of a thousand cats. Yes, the dream of a thousand yeah. cats. That's it. And uh, I I think that uh, that was really interesting because it was a, a very fresh take on on cats. I'm sure at the time oh, and it still is. That was so hard for me to read. I just was like, and I'll, anything with like Bast, it's just like I just can't. It makes me too mm, sad. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so that's the one I can I, that comes to mind uh, right away for me. Um, there's definitely uh, other cats. Oh, there's that Andrew McLean uh, book um, that he did for Dark Horse, where it's a it's a uh, it's like an apocalyptic uh, world, and uh, it's a, it's a woman and and her cat, and they're just kind of like you know best friends, and they're they're going around. I don't remember the name of, the, of that one either. Um, what do you think about the Red Lantern that's a cat, Dexstar? <laughs> you've read any of those? <laughs> do you know, I, I have not. Um, interestingly enough, I'm not super deep on DC and Marvel. Um, mm-hmm. DC a little, a little more, but, uh, you know, because I, I grew up, like I said, in, in, in Venezuela, in South America, and um, there was just no comic book stores, right? And um, sometimes you would find a s- single issues at the at the newsstand, basically, um, you know, and and there were definitely, uh, you know, like uh, like strips, right, comic strips on, on newspapers. Yeah. Um, but so there would be like you could find maybe a Superman issue or a Batman issue. Um, and uh, but there wasn't uh, there wasn't a lot of Green Lantern. So I think they just. Um, you know, my experience with, with the lanterns was more in like cartoons um, when I was growing up. Um, and, um, and then I, I was disconnected from comics for a while. And by the time I came back to them, I was not really interested in superheroes. I wanted to see more mm-hmm. of a, you know, uh, a Sandman. I wanted to read, a, you know, Fear Agent, I, all, other stuff like that. Why the Last Man? Uh, and that's yeah. kind of what captivated me to like get into comics again. And I still mm-hmm. pick up a few things, like you know, I think uh, like the Vision or Mister Miracle. It's a, from Tom King. It's a fantastic, mm-hmm. um, you know, series. But I don't go for the the straightforward uh, books so much. Oh, and then uh, Immortal Hulk is one that I'm actually reading right now that I that I think oh, is okay. really really cool. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a big gap on my knowledge of of superhero comics for sure. Well, I think that's fine. I mean, like, I like having people come in from such a diversity of sources and backgrounds in their art. And it's, it's really important. Like, I love your background in mm. music. Um, and yeah, I was wondering sort of if you could talk a little bit about how, how that connects to your writing. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, the, the biggest similarity to when I make music and when I write is that I definitely disconnect myself um, from, I feel like I disconnect myself from the world, right, in a way, and I'm trying to access like some subconscious elements of my mind, right? Um, and the way I make music is very exploratory, right? I have a, you know, I, I try a lot of different settings with analog synthesizers, like tape uh, machines, like different things, and I'm, I'm trying, it's almost like I'm searching for something. Uh, and I feel like the way I'm, I'm right is very similar to that. I mean, I do outline a little bit uh, when I'm, I'm writing issues, but then I'm going in just trying to um, explore, you know, uh, w- what's happening in that world. And as I write things, I tend to change what the outline is to a story. Um, so 
Um, yeah, and I think there, there's a lot of similarities between um, you know music creation and, and writing as well. Um, there's uh, the aspect of like pacing, right? Um, there's the aspect of, of the rhythm of music versus yeah. the rhythm in a comic book. And there's the aspect of, of color, basically, right? You can make music that's really harsh and violent, um, and you can, make, uh, you can write a, a, a scene that's definitely the same way. Um, so I see them both as forms of communication. Uh, for a long time, music was the one outlet that I had. Uh, for you know, uh, communicating beyond words, <laughs> and now I, you know, I'm, I'm telling story with comic books. But it feels like the process is very similar. When I have an idea for something, and then I, I'm exploring around it until I find uh, what I'm looking for. That's interesting. Like, mm -hmm. do you think that the aesthetics that you really like learn, like you know, from punk music? Mm -hmm. And from avant-garde, like it's hard to even explain Mars Bow for those who don't know them. So <laughs> I will, I will not try. But you should go check them out. It feels like something folks should know. They're like yeah. really important. Um, you know, like as that contributed to your aesthetic sense as a writer. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it also goes to show, uh, goes to show in the artists that I'm that I'm I'm choosing to work with as well. Uh, when you look at Juan's work, and obviously when you look at Alexis's work, they're not your standard, typical, um, you know, um, um, artists, right? The art is it's different. It jumps at you. Um, for me, it feels more alive. It feels uh, like Juan's art, for example, to me, just like Alexis's art, feels very psychedelic. Juan's art feels almost like improvisational to me in a way, mm. um, where it's full of energy and it doesn't, it feels like very from the moment. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I don't, I prefer artists that are, that are kind of putting this, this more um, interesting energy into what they're drawing rather than someone that's drawing something really realistic in a way. Um, so I, I tend, uh, both of this, you know, when I, um, for working with Juan was the same thing when I saw his books um, at the comic book store and immediately I, I was I was drawn to to the artwork right um, and he was someone that I was using as a reference uh, for when I was working on straight at the beginning I was looking for um, uh, I was using him and and yeah he was one of the main artists that I was using and um, as a reference, and I was trying to find something that was like that. And I tried a few artists that didn't work out for different reasons. Uh, um, and uh, then I was really frustrated because I really wanted to tell this story. And I actually emailed Juan, um, thinking that there was no way he was going to do it because I'm a, I was new to the world of comics. Even though I, I've done mm -hmm. other stuff in entertainment, this was my first comic book, realistically. And uh, he, uh, he, I just happened to catch him between projects, and he read the script and he loved it. And then we talked on the phone uh, for a while, and uh, I, ex I explained him where the story was going, and he, and he was really into it. And, and we found that we had some things in similar from our background because he's also, um, you know, uh, comes from a Latin background. Uh, and he lived in New York for a long time. Um, so we had some things in common, and we just, you know, it just kind of clicked right away. And he very much felt, um, again, going back to impro improvisational music, when you improvise with someone and it works, um, it, it feels like, oh, I know this person, I know what they're about, right? There's something that clicks in the sounds that you're making and, and how they're coming together. And this very much felt like that with Juan, where I felt like, okay, this is someone that I'm, I'm playing, in, in this case, the writer, um, and then the artwork is kind of working with it, you know? So um, the, there was definitely similarities in there for me. Awesome. Yeah. How did you get into punk back when, when you were 14? <laughs> uh, so I, let, let me think about this. I think, you know, it was the 90s and I saw <laughs> like Nirvana on TV, you know, and like MTV yeah. or something. And it blew my mind, right? Um, and yeah. then I, I started to really like look into grunge and, and punk and, and all that sort of stuff. And I remember that I happened to be lucky enough to, to come to... Um, to the U.S. Uh, one vacation and I went to like Lollapalooza or Leon or something on my own. I had to take mm -hmm. a bus. I had to figure it out. <laughs> and then I came back home and like among my friends that also were getting into this stuff, I was like, I was, I was like this hero just because I had seen, uh, you know, bands like 
I don't know, like the breeders and, and Stereo Lab and, you know, Vans, like, we're just different and weird. Not necessarily punk. Well, L7 play, which is pretty punk. But, oh, yeah. Uh, so, oh, you were at that year of Lollapalooza. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Yes. That's like I a think, key year. I think it was 93 or 94. It's I don't the se- remember. The second year, I think. Yeah. yeah, I don't remember exactly, but that was the one year that I saw it. And then, you know, uh, a few of my friends that were musicians were like, let's start a band. Uh, and I'm like, I don't know how to play anything. Uh, so I, by default, I was a singer. Uh, and I started, you know, I just really had a, had a blast uh, expressing myself in that way. I come from a, from a cat, very Catholic family. And uh, also, um, um, you know, my dad is uh, very conservative. Uh, so for me, it was like a way of, uh, you know, expressing myself that I did not have um, necessarily access to before like music changed my life uh, I would probably be a civil engineer <laughs> or something like mm-hmm. that you know working on construction which is my dad's business which is totally fine but uh, you know I, I'm, I'm very I feel lucky and I feel very happy that I found music and through music I found you know art and and uh, other things that, that were more interesting and more creative um, and so they asked me to be in this band and I we started writing some songs and you know, we made like a tape, a demo tape, and they played it on the radio, and we played like some festivals. So I was this 14-year-old kid like singing in a band, and um, I had a mohawk for a weekend uh, one time, and I was trying to hide it from my dad. So I like I sh- completely shaved my head after the show. <laughs> um, hmm. So this oh, is wow. kind of like my my early memories of like you know doing music like that. And of course, I you know there was, my family was a little bit, my dad specifically was a little bit terrified that that I was going into that world, you know, because there were people that would do bad things, <laughs> right? Uh, but that wasn't the case at all. Um, you know, it was just very, very clean and, and very, uh, like, very energetic to be part of that scene in Venezuela. And there were a number of bands, too, that were coming up at the time, and we were all friends and, like, you know, play each other's shows and stuff like that. Um, so there was really a scene that you guys are There was a little scene, yeah. I'm from a little city that was uh, called Barquisimeto, which is in the middle mm-hmm. of Venezuela. And back then, you know, the, the small independent music press that existed would say, like, you know, Barquisimeto was the Seattle of, of Venezuela. Uh, that was <laughs> I a love joke. it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I was part of that scene for a while. Uh, and then eventually, you know, I... Uh, I I also, you know, got deeper into True Nirvana. I found out about Sonic Youth, which is a band that I love, um, and uh, it's one of my favorite bands. And then through that, I found about more strange, like uh, Japanese bands, like the Wurdoms, and then Mersbau and Masona, and so on. Um, and um, and and yeah. And then when I moved to the U.S. Um, my, oh, so uh, when I was in the band in Venezuela, the other thing that's uh, another story that's interesting is that. Um, I, my dad would not buy me a guitar, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, or my family wouldn't buy me a guitar. So I had a bicycle, which I traded in high school with another kid for his guitar. Um, and that was the way that I started playing a little bit of guitar. Um, and then when I came to the U.S., I think it was my grandma for my, I think it was like my uh, 18 or 19th birthday when I, when I moved to the U.S., um, uh, sent me like a hundred and. $120 or something so I took that and I bought like the cheapest guitar and amp you know which is what I could afford and I started uh, um, you know uh, also um, uh, playing some music in the US and eventually I met some uh, kindred, uh, kindred spirits uh, and I started playing in a band uh, in Florida uh, a band was called Monotract and uh, we, uh, we were playing like really noisy uh, some rock on it but really noisy music and um, uh, one of our I, uh, one of our friends uh, was a mutual friend with uh, Thurston Moore from Sonic Youth and I um, I emailed him and I sent him our 7 inch that we were putting out and he liked it and he invited us to play a show in New York and after that after we we tour and we play that show in New York we had to move to New York so I left Florida after uh, three years of living in Florida and I moved to New York with my bandmates and uh, you know that was kind of um, the the beginning of my my music stuff that later led to like the label and playing with a lot of people that I admire growing up like members from Sonic Youth who I I listened to when I was like you know uh, 14, 15 and, uh, and then I got to play with them later on that's an awesome story. I and 
I, I really do think that there's like a real connection between independent comics and 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 punk music and other mm-hmm. kinds of independent music. I mean, a lot of the sort of self promotion and community building, yep. but also like the way you have sort of self perpetuated sense of aesthetics that people like deny that there's rules, but there really are. Yep. Like, there's a lot of parallels there. Yeah, and I think that you know the other aspect of it that feels very much like like comics is. Um, uh, you know, when I ran the festival and when I did the label, I, I did over uh, 60 releases over a period of 10 years that the label ran before I stopped it. And it felt, you know, it's very similar to a way you would do an independent comic book where you're getting like, you know, you're getting the, the person to do it. You're figuring out how you're going to record it. Someone's doing the artwork for the cover and then you go and send it to press, right? And you get an LP back or a CD or whatever and then you have to distribute it, right? And you have to talk to independent distributors. And if you're lucky, you find a you know distributor in Europe that will take your records and so on. Uh, so that aspect of doing it yourself, uh, it's, it's, uh, has some parallels with, uh, with comics for sure. Awesome. Yeah, I definitely feel it. Yeah. I think... Um, are, are there have been uh, ways in which comics have connected you with different kinds of other art and media that you were interested in, or have you been able to use or looking to use your comics to help introduce folks to uh, music that's significant to you? Yeah, so um, definitely. So one thing that I'm doing with Straight is that I'm, I'm actually doing a, a soundtrack of, uh, um, you know, like basically abstract I don't know, space music, I guess, uh, to go mm-hmm. with every issue. Uh, that's going to be on my band camp. Um, and uh, yeah, it's going to be like 20 minutes of music per issue. So I, I hope that that is like an introduction to something that's different to some people, right? Um, so uh, that's an aspect of it, um, uh, for sure. Um, and, uh, and as far as like finding about another art, um, I mean, there's definitely... Um, you know, artwork that I that I've gotten into because of uh, of comics, um, and um, uh, you know, I mean, uh, James Jean is like someone that comes to mind right away, right? Who did covers for Fables, and I really love uh, his his artwork, um, um, uh, for example. Uh, but I, you know, I, I always was interested in 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 art, anyways, from very early on. Um, so. Um, I think it might have been the other way around where my understanding of art made me understand, um, you know, or change the way that I approach uh, um, certain comic books uh, that I that I was drawn to because I knew, you know, um, certain uh, modern art that felt resonant in that way. Um, yeah. Cool. I definitely am interested, like, I think about, you know, when I got getting into comics as a young person, and I and I also feel like there's a lot of young people who I think comics were the only way that they ever got to hear about, you know, certain kinds of more obscure music, especially from other generations. Like, I know there's like a whole generation of kids who probably only know Calling Sister Midnight by Iggy Pop because it's in Sandman. Like, <laughs> right, for a very, right, like, right, narrow right, window right, of, like, nerdy right, people. Right, but, like, right. Sandman's pretty damn popular, you know? Yeah, and then, um, you know, there's, like, a, a, what's that? Uh, um, Shelley Bond's uh, uh, imprint, uh, mm-hmm. Black Crown, right? Black Which Crown. Is very much that has that that music uh, aesthetic to it and that punk energy to it um, that yeah. is very interesting. Uh, oh, they all- she has been on the show as well. Oh, mm-hmm. awesome! I, I believe I, I I probably listened to that. I met her once actually at San Diego Comic Con last year, and um, she was very nice. I gave her a copy of a Straight when I was pitching it back then. Um, so yeah, um, nice. Yeah, and I I mean I it, that was a really um, so I I. I've been going to San Diego Comic Con for a long time because I of my work on video games, which is kind of like my day job, um, and uh, and so I I got that's partially how I got exposed again to comic books, um, but I didn't really go to other ones till about two years ago when I went to. Um, last year I went to uh, Emerald City and I went to C2E2 um, and I went to to a bunch of them and I got started to get exposed to like the different artists, the creators, and I actually at that point already had issue one of Straight completed, so I printed 
uh, kind of like an ash can, uh, but full color version that I gave out to, to anyone. It was kind of like my calling car, and that's how I met Alexis, and that led to Space Riders, but also I made a lot of um, connections to different people that way. And at that San Diego Comic Con last year, uh, like I said, I met Shelly Vaughn, uh, Karen Berger was there too, and I got to talk to her for a little bit, and that was awesome. Um, but I yeah. also met the editor who actually ended up picking up straight for Dark Horse, uh, Spencer uh, Cushing, who, um, you know, uh, kind of championed it internally and, and made it happen. So, um, uh, yeah, that, that was a special, I think that was a special couple of days for me uh, last year. Well, I how I saw that you mentioned in your bio that you worked on Ugly Americans, which was an animated <laughs> show on Cartoon Network. Yeah, that I really quite enjoyed. Um, was about was it one season? Um, it was two seasons. Yeah, two, two seasons. seasons. I watched yeah. them both, though. I swear to you, yeah, they were um, short. They were short. Yeah, I love that okay. show. Um, yeah, so we made a video game. Uh, so my involvement uh, back then uh, oh. with Comedy Central was uh, I, I was eventually I, I was a producer for games uh, for the different shows and eventually I uh, I became a creative director for for gaming uh, there for Comedy Central for a while but uh, um, you know we got to made a, a, a game it was a shooter game it wasn't that great but it, it was the art uh, we got a lot of original art from Devin who's the creator of the show and we got to talk to him a lot and uh, we kind of created the game with him uh, we had to create it really fast because of TV schedules and you know um, it was it was uh, it was for Comedy Central. So, um, but we had a, a great time uh, making that, and I I, I really enjoy um, you know being able to work in that um, game for Ugly Americans, which is yeah really an amazing show. I it's one of those shows that like I don't understand why it didn't go on for like you know 10, 12, 15 seasons or something. I think animation can be expensive sometimes, and That's I don't know true. if the shows want to um, invest in it. I think it's worth it. Like I really, I thought it was as a New Yorker. There were so many great New York touches in it, yeah. And the whole idea of like the way monsters are treated by society in it, it was some good social commentary. And yeah, I loved the pigeons. Oh, my oh God. yeah, the pigeons. The pigeons were in the game too. They're they're hilarious. Uh, they they curse all the time, right? Um, and, and they like beat people up with their yeah, balls. They're super mean. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, actually, now that you're mentioning that, I have a T-shirt that I still have from when I was working on it that basically says "Embrace uh, Diversity," and it has all the hands of like different aliens, different uh, characters from the show, basically like kind of touching. Uh, you know, in the middle, it's like six or seven hands, kind of fist. Uh, yeah pumping. and I yeah so the definitely there was that aspect and I also was living in New York when I was working on it so I could feel you know that 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 um you know the same vibe that you were feeling where it's like oh this is very much like it is in New York with the immigrants and uh, you know the different areas and uh gentrifying and and you know what's happening in parks all that kind of stuff was there so yeah yeah well thank you so much for coming on um I'm trying to think, like, how can folks be sure to get your comics as they're arriving? And for Straight, it, became, it be, begins coming out August 14. Uh, and uh, the diamond code, if you need it for your store, you should just be able to say you want to get Straight. But it's uh, J-U-N-1-9-0-3-1-5. And then it's going to be coming out monthly after that. And uh Space Riders release was delayed a bit. Uh, it looks like they'll actually be out in the fall, and Space Riders will be out from Black Mass Comics in the fall. Uh, you can go ahead and ask for it now, and they will be sure to put it aside for you. Uh, both mm -hmm. books, uh, obviously, will be like on Comixology and all that, if that's the way um, people consume those books. Um, but, um, yeah, so um, they're coming this summer, and they will continue to come out for the rest of the year. Uh, and also, uh, you know, if people want to follow um, the progress of that, there's a lot of uh, cool stuff that we'll be posting. Both me and Juan will be posting on social media um, as well. And those playlists, for example. Yes. Song playlists. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, Alexis actually does some really cool playlists for Space Riders. So I'm sure he's going to do those as well. Uh, and then yeah. the, the original soundtrack for Straight will be available on my Bandcamp. 
uh, and uh, wait, it, I, it's just my name on it. So Carlos Gifoni. Oh, so you composed the song. I'm composing for it. all. Yeah, all the, oh, the music for it. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I've already done with the first one, and I think you can. There's a preview of it that, that you can listen to if you look at my Twitter. It's in a post there. Um, I'm also my website should be up early July. I took it down for a while to kind of rework it, um, but that will be at carlosgifoni.com. Um, and then um, my Twitter handle is just my first and last name, Carlos Gifoni, and you should be able to find those things in there. Um, That's G-I-F-F-O-N-I. Well, thank you like, again for, for joining us and for, for bringing your cultural context, which I think is really valuable as well. Awesome. And for our listeners, you can find me on Twitter all the damn time, sorry to say, uh, E-L-A-N-A <laughs> underscore Brooklyn. And of course, Graphic Policy Radio. We are now on Spotify in addition to being on iTunes and SoundCloud and the rest. So if you prefer to get your podcast through Spotify, you can listen to us there. Uh, so please go there, give us a rating and review. That'll definitely also help and share. And as we like to say, keep it geeky. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.